Okay. Newborn nutrition and feeding. We're going to start with engorgement. Engorgement, this is a common response to, uh, excuse me, a common response of the breast to sudden change in hormones and the onset of significantly increased milk volume in lactogenesis stage two. It usually occurs three to five days after birth as the milk transitions from colostrum, remember colostrum, that's that first milk that the baby gets, to mature milk. <laughs> Milk production is copious. That means a whole lot, okay? Milk production is copious. As milk rapidly increases, the volume can exceed the storage capacity of the alveoli in the breast. So just imagine how uncomfortable that could be. The breasts then become firm, tender, and hot, and they can appear shiny and taut. Taut means tight. The areola are firm and the nipples can flatten, making it hard for the infant to latch onto the breast. Because back pressure on full milk glands inhibits milk production, if the milk is not removed from the breast, the milk supply can diminish. This is very important. And I remembered my highlighter. So what they're saying, guys, is very important for mom to be able to express that milk or then engorgement gets even worse. Early and frequent feedings may help prevent engorgement. Emptying one breast at each feeding and alternating which breast is offered first at each feeding can also help to prevent engorgement. Engorgement is a temporary condition that's usually resolved within 24 hours. The mother's instructed to feed eight to 12 times in 24 hours softening at least one breast and pumping or hand expressing the other breast as needed to soften it. She has to get that milk out. Frequently used interventions for engorgement include, and guys, usually for uh, testing purposes, this is a select all that apply, make sure you know them. So the interventions, use of cold, such as ice packs, gel packs, Cold compresses, warmth, such as warm uh, compresses, warm showers, cabbage leaves. Cabbage leaves has been seen on NCLEX many times. Cabbage leaves, anti-inflammatory medications, breast massage, hand expression or pumping, and reverse pressure softening. To reduce swelling of the breast tissue surrounding the milk ducts, ice packs are often recommended in 10 to 15 minutes on 45 minutes off rotation between feedings. The ice pack should cover both breasts. Large bags of frozen peas can make it easy and can be refrozen between uses. I put a star next to this, it's important, make sure you know it. Fresh raw cabbage leaves placed over the breast between feedings can help relieve engorgement. So twice in the text, they talked about the cabbage, right? And then if you look down, here goes a figure about the cabbage. Pay attention when you guys are studying and you're seeing the same information repeating itself in different ways, that means it's gonna be a test question somewhere. You're gonna see it again. You're gonna place them over the breast for 15 to 20 minutes. Frequent application of cabbage, oh, this is what, the third, fourth time? Frequent application of cabbage leaves can decrease milk supply. Cabbage leaves should not be used if the mother's allergic to cabbage or develops a skin rash. You guys know heat causes vasodilation. Because heat increases blood flow, its application to an already congested breast is usually counterproductive. However, occasionally standing in warm water starts milk leaking. All right, let's talk about um, nipple discomfort. The key, the key to preventing sore nipples is correct breastfeeding technique. Limiting the time at the breast does not prevent sore nipples. What happens is the baby's not latching on correctly and that's what's causing the sore nipples. Soreness is often a result of the mother allowing the baby to latch onto the breast before the mouth is open wide. Let's talk about mastitis.
Mastitis, this is an infectious pro uh, process of the breast. It's characterized by sudden onset influenza-like symptoms, including, make sure you know these signs and symptoms, high fever, chills, malaise, body ache, headache, nausea, and vomiting. The woman usually has localized <laughs> breast pain and tenderness and a hot, reddened area on the breast. And usually this last part is the key to let you know that's what we're dealing with, a hot, reddened area on the breast. Certain factors can predispose a woman to mastitis. You have to know those risk factors. Inadequate emptying of the breast is common. This can be related to a variety of factors, including engorgement. And you guys know that. Any fluid that just sits there and doesn't move, right? That's a perfect medium for bacteria to grow for the person to have infection. Oversupply of milk, plugged ducts, sudden decrease in the number of feedings, or abrupt bleeding. And if you look at everything that's just been mentioned, at the end of the day, all of this leads to what? That milk just sitting there in the breast, right? Sore, sore crack nipples can lead to mastitis by providing a portal of entry for the causative organism. Stress, fatigue, maternal illness, ill family members, Breast trauma and poor maternal nutrition also are predisposing factors for mastitis. Talk about treatment. Treatment of mastitis includes bed rest, antibiotics, measures to reduce pain and swelling, such as anti-inflammatory medications and cold compresses. And you see, I highlighted this in orange, continued lactation, getting that milk out of the breast. Complete emptying of the breast through breastfeeding, hand expression, or pumping is important. The infection cannot be transmitted to the infant. It's important to teach mom that because if she has mastitis, she, she'll be afraid that she, you know, she's going to pass it on to the baby. Adequate fluid intake and balanced diet are important for the mother with mastitis. Take a look at the safety alert. A bottle should never be propped with a pillow or other inanimate object and left with the infant for so many reasons. The infant can choke, they can aspirate. Um, and it's very important. Feeding should be a time that the, that the parent bonds with the baby. So you have to teach the parents, you can't just prop a bottle and stick that bottle in the baby's mouth and go on about your day. This practice can result in choking and it deprives the infant of important interaction with the parent during feeding. Moreover, propping the bottle has been implicated in causing nursing bottle caries or decay of the first teeth resulting from continuous bathing of the teeth with a carbohydrate containing fluid as the infant sporadically sucks the nipple. This actually is on Anquest as well. Hold on the knee. I like that. Yeah, propping the bottles often cause, causes the first um, cavity of the baby. Because what happens is, because that bottle's propped, often that milk just sits there on the gums. <clears throat> Safety alert. Alternate milk sources such as goat's milk, skim milk, low-fat milk, condensed milk or raw unpasteurized milk from any animal source should not be fed to infants. Why? They're inadequate to grow support, to support growth, and they contain excess protein or an inadequate calcium to phosphorus ratio, which can cause seizures in the infant. Breast milk or formula, that's it. Once they turn one years old, once they're 12 months old, then they can get the gallon milk. Safety alert. An important aspect to impress on families is that the proportions must not be altered. You have to teach the caregivers that they need when they're making the formula to prepare it exactly as ordered. Don't say to themselves, well, my baby's big bone, so let me put a little bit extra more powder. Mm -hmm. Or my baby's too big, so I, you know, he or she needs to lose weight, so let me just water it down. 
They need to follow the directions. Neither diluted to extend the amount of the formula, nor concentrated to provide more calories. The newborn's kidneys are immature. Giving the infant overly concentrated formula can provide protein and minerals in amounts that exceeds the excretory ability of the kidney. So they're not going to be able to get rid of it. 